please open your Bibles on the book of Acts chapter 8. And we'll read starting verse 4. We'll read through verse 25. Book of Acts chapter 8. We'll start reading in verse 4. So Luke writes, Now, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds, with one accord, paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. But there was a man named Simon, who had previously practiced magic in the city, and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But once they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he, meaning Simon, he was amazed. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that, saw that the Spirit was given through the laying, uh, uh, laying on the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. That's the word of God. A great Charles Spurgeon once said, he says, many learned men are defending the gospel. No doubt it is a very proper and right thing to do, yet I always notice that when there are most books of that kind, it is because the gospel itself is not being preached. Suppose a number of persons were to take into their heads that they had to defend a lion, a full-grown king of beasts, beasts. There he is in the cage, and here come all the soldiers of the army to fight for him. Well, I should suggest to them, if they would not object, and feel that it was humbling to them, that they would, should kindly stack back 
and open the door and let the lion out. I believe that would be the best way of defending him, for he would take care of himself. Interestingly, uh, Charles Persian continues and says, and the best apology for the gospel is to let the gospel out. Never mind about defending Deuteronomy or the whole of the Pentateuch. Preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. Let the lion out and see who will dare to approach him. The lion of the tribe of Judah will soon drive, will soon drive away all his adversaries. Dear friends, Jesus said, I will build my church and, remember what's following? And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And he built his church. And he built it with the gospel. And yet, it has been estimated that probably 95% of all believers, of all church members, do not preach the gospel. And thus, they have never led anyone to Christ. You know what? The book of Acts is an excellent illustration of the spread of the gospel. If you remember, the book of Acts was written by Luke. He wrote the first, uh, the first volume, I would say, is his gospel of Luke. And his gospel of Luke, he actually talks about how the word, how the gospel actually became available through Jesus Christ. And in the book of Acts, in the very first chapter, first verses, he says, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up. That's what he wrote in the first book, in the Gospel of Luke. Here, in the book of Acts, he actually describes how this gospel was taken and brought to the people. Interesting enough that in uh, chapter 1, verse 8, uh, Luke writes uh, Jesus' words. Jesus said at that time, you, he talked to the apostles, he says, you will be my witnesses. You will preach the gospel. He says, you will be my witnesses first in Jerusalem, right, where you are right now. And then he says, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And if you would look at the book of Acts, that's how it fulfills we can see that chapters 1 through 7 show how the disciples became witnesses in Jerusalem first because everything what they were doing, chapters 1 through 7, they were preaching in Jerusalem. Then chapters 8 through 12, they preaching the gospel in Judea and Samaria. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, then Judea and Samaria. And chapters 13 through 28, witnesses to the whole world beyond Judea and Samaria. And our text that we read this morning is not an exception. It speaks about the spread of the gospel. It speaks how the gospel was brought to that group of people which are Samaritans. And we see that Christians were not ashamed of the gospel. They were preaching the gospel. And I would like to take two important implications from this text. I want us to make two important implications. It's not application yet. Application will be uh, later. But two important implications from the text that we read. The first one, the first implication that we can make is preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. That's the first uh, implication. As you have seen when we read the text that the events uh, happened when the disciples were scattered. While they, while they were scattered. Well, actually, uh, it's, if you go just a little bit up, uh, three verses in 8.1. Acts 8.1 says that Saul uh, was ravaging, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they, meaning all believers, they were scattered. They were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. 
Jesus said the gospel must be preached. You will go and you will preach the gospel. And in his providence, God directs the circumstances in such a way that the gospel is preached. I like how someone said, if you will not fulfill Acts 1.8, meaning Jesus says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, then you should go further in Judea and Samaria and then to the ends. Disciples at that point, they liked being in Jerusalem. They were all together. They liked being all together, one big church. If we read uh, chapters 1 through 7, basically, they had everything in common. They shared everything together. They didn't want to go anywhere. Like, we have beautiful church. Why would go anywhere? But God says, no, you need to go. How to make them go? Well, let's make some persecutions. And you'll go. So if you do not fulfill Acts 1.8, you will experience Acts 8.1, meaning the persecution will come. And that's what happened. And in our text, we see that those who were scattered, they went about preaching the word. They went and they were preaching the word, and they preaching the word meaning proclaiming the good news. That's the, the word that's being used. We see that Philip, in verse 5, he was proclaiming to them Christ. And later in verse 12, we see that um, Philip preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. So our text is talking about preaching nothing but the gospel. But let's see. Let's see who can preach the gospel. Maybe you're listening right now. Okay, that's, that's good. They went about, they started preaching, but who actually can preach the gospel? Can I preach the gospel? Can someone else preach the gospel? And to whom should I preach the gospel? So let's see. The first what we see here, we see that the gospel was preached by every Christian. Absolutely every Christian. If you, if you look at verse 4 again, you can see that those who were scattered, meaning all the Christians, because as we read that all were scattered throughout regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. So basically just regular Christians like you and I, they were scattered and they were scattered and went about preaching the word. You see, in spite of, of the persecution, people... They went and were preaching the word. I, I always think like, okay, we have persecutions. And by the way, those persecutions that we read here in verse 8, it's not the same persecution that we read about in the um, letter of Peter, where Peter writes about the persecution that became, uh, or came to Judea because of, well, actually those were in Rome because of Nero. He burned the city and he, he accused the Christians. This one is different. This one is the persecution from Jews because Jews were hating Christians and they were persecuting Christians. And we know that Saul, who will be Paul in the future, Saul, they, he actually was looking for Christians. He wanted to kill them. So, and what we see again, we see that the persecutions started, persecution arose, and they could have gone quietly. Why would we draw attention? Why would we speak to anyone? We can go quietly and just, just go among and live among the people. We don't have to draw attention. We don't have to kind of create additional persecution on ourselves because we just left Judea. We just want to live peacefully and quietly. But no, we read that they went and they were preaching the gospel. They were preaching the word. And then in verse 5, we read that Philip went down and he was preaching to them Christ. Who was Philip? Philip was one of the seven men, if you look back in chapter 6, book of Acts, chapter 6, he was one of seven men uh, chosen to serve tables. Yes, he was full of the spirit and of wisdom, because that was the requirement for those seven men. But he was not an apostle. He was not someone special. He was the guy who was chosen to serve tables. So if you are helping in the kitchen, does it mean that you can preach the gospel? Of course. If you are helping to clean some like rooms in here, does it mean that you can preach the gospel? 
Of course. And I don't want to minimize Philip. I don't want to say that he was someone insignificant. No, of course, he was the person whom God used. But at the same time, he was not any different from any of us. He was the same person who was chosen to serve tables, who was chosen to serve people. It means that any person who is serving, he's able to preach the gospel. What does it mean? That means that any believer who understands the gospel, if you are a believer, if you understand the gospel, you have the line, as we read. You have that line, brothers and sisters. You have it. But not just that. Who did they preach the gospel to? So if I say like, Every Christian preached the gospel. Then they preached to everyone. Uh, again, if you look back to verse 4, uh, we see that those who were scattered that went about preaching the word. A little bit later in the book of Acts, chapter 11, verse 19, you can see that those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen... They traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. So they went far north from Jerusalem. And it says there, speaking the word or preaching the word to no one except, except Jews. But in our text, we say that they went about preaching the word. And then in verse 5, we see that Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed Christ to them. We might not hear anything unusual about this. Okay, Philip went to Samaria. What's important about it? But for the Jew to go and preach the gospel to a Samaritan person or to, to a person in Samaria, that was unheard of because there was a long, long standing and a very deep-seated hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans. And that hostility was going way back to Nehemiah and Ezra. And you probably can't even remember how Jesus, when he was passing through Samaria, he stopped at the well. And the woman at the well, when he asked her, can you give me something to drink? She was like, you? A man and a Jew, you asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? And right after that, John explains, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. They have nothing in common. They didn't want to have anything in common. And when Jesus was giving a parable um, on who is my neighbor, he's intentionally talking, remember, uh, he says, there was a Levi, there was a priest who was passing by that person who was beaten and laying on the road. And then he says, a Samaritan. Samaritan actually walked onto that person. And he says, that Samaritan, he took him up and he intentionally brought that Samaritan to that uh, uh, parable because they didn't like, and I would say, they actually hated each other. Jews hated Samaritans and Samaritans hated Jews because of that long lasting um, tension that they had. But we see that Philip, he went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed Christ to them, to those who were hated by the Jews. And not just that, not just that. We see that Philip was preaching to the whole city and even Simon the Magician. What's so special about the Simon the Magician? So he preached to everyone who was in the city. Well, the magician, it's kind of an interesting term. The term magic referred originally to the lore of the magi or the priest of the Medo-Persians. And it was a mix. A mix. It's not magic like we understand magic this way when I do the trick. I put a box, put a rabbit inside, and I make it open. Like it looks like there's nothing. And then I pull out the rabbit out of the box. That's magic, which we understand as magic. In their terms, the word magic was different. Magic, it was the mix of science, 
superstition, combining astrology, divination, occultic practices, then mathematics, agriculture, and it could be either trickery or demonic. And we see that Simon most likely believed in his powers because if you look at um, verse 9, Simon was saying that he himself was somebody great. He thought that he's somebody great. So most likely he was performing his magic with the help of demons. That's what they often done uh, as magician at that time. So what do we do when we see people that even slightly remind us of demon-possessed people? When you encounter someone even slightly reminding you of demon-possessed people, well, I, I don't know about you, but I don't want to have anything with that kind of person. I'm like, okay, I better go away from that person. I don't, I don't want to spend any time with that person. But we see that he was preaching the gospel to the whole city, and even to that magician, to the Simon the magician. He knew that he needs the gospel. He knew that he has the lion, and he needs to release the lion, the lion who will take care of himself, brothers and sisters. If you are Christians, if you understood the gospel, you have the lion, and quite often that lion is sitting in the cage, we need to release the line. We need to let people hear the gospel. We need to preach the gospel, but why? What's the reason? Why did Philip was preaching the gospel? Why he didn't preach any like, moral life? He, why he didn't go to Samaria saying, okay, you need to understand that you need to live much better. Your life is totally wrong. Why didn't he say to Simon the magician, Simon, you didn't just stop doing your magic. You need to start living good, moral life. You cannot live like that. It's not, it's not good. No, why did they preach the gospel? There's a third thing about preaching the gospel. The gospel is preached for salvation. The gospel is preached for salvation. Friends, the preaching of the gospel it was, was what was done by the apostles. That's what they were doing in Jerusalem. And remember what happened when they were preaching the gospel? Thousands, thousands of people believed and they were saved. Look at our text, verse 12. Look at verse 12 again. We see that when they believed Philip as he preached Good news, the gospel. As he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Philip doesn't adopt new methods. He doesn't try to convince them in his cleverness that he's so smart, that he knows much better than they are. But why he doesn't do that? Friends, if there is no gospel, there is no salvation. There is no gospel. There is no salvation. Peter was preaching in Acts 4, and he says, Acts 4.12, he says, There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That's only Jesus. There is no salvation if there is no preaching of the gospel. There is no preaching of Jesus Christ. In Romans 16, Paul writes in Romans 1, 16, Romans 1, chapter 1, verse 16, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Why? He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, even though a lot of people think that it's stupidity. They think it's dumb. He says, I'm not ashamed of it. Why? Because or for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone. It is the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. This is why every Christian who understands the gospel, who has that line, must 
release the line, must preach the gospel to everyone if we want people to be saved. We must give them the gospel. And maybe the question you have right now, what is the gospel? If I just invite people to the church and say, well, come to our church. We have such a beautiful church, aren't we? We have a wonderful church. We have really beautiful music team. We have beautiful choir. We have people who are so nice. Come to our church if you're looking for a friend or maybe for a wife. Come to our church. It's beautiful. You can find a really good person in here. Is that the gospel? Unfortunately not. It's not the gospel. The true gospel, the true gospel will always show a person true and holy God. The true gospel will always tell a person there is a God. There is God who is holy. And there is no one, nothing unclean can be in front of that God. And the true gospel will always tell that person that he is a wretched and doomed sinner. You are a sinner And because God is so holy, you will never be able to stand in front of him. It doesn't matter how well you'll try to live your life, you will never be good enough. There is no way you can become holy as God is holy. And that's why the only way of salvation is through Jesus Christ, who lived the holy life for you and for me. Only through him. That's the gospel. And that's the line that will defend himself. Quite often you tell the gospel to a person and he listens and he says, so you want to tell me that a Jew who died 2,000 years ago on the cross can save me from my sins? No, it doesn't make any sense. And it doesn't for a non-believer. But this is the gospel. This is the true gospel, and that's the saving gospel. And Philip was preaching the gospel. But not just that. We said that the gospel was preached by every Christian to everyone. It was preached for salvation, but it also was preached for much joy. I love that in verse 8. In verse 8, we see that there was much joy in that city was much joy can we say that the joy was related to the signs and the healings performed by philip because right before that we see that the crowns were paying attention to what being said by philip and they they saw the signs and they saw that the unclean spirits were crying out and uh, came coming out of uh, those who had them and the paralyzed or lame were healed Maybe the joy was because of that. The paralyzed or lame were healed. The uh, demon-possessed were clean up for demon possession. Uh, it could be, but I would say the joy we see here is an eschatological joy. These signs were the proof of the message Philip preached. And they were pointing to God's deliverance. This joy is the joy of of salvation it's the result of salvation they knew even samaritans they knew that whenever god comes he will perform these miracles and and then philip he was doing that he was preaching the gospel and he was proving his gospel with these miracles and there was much joy because of the salvation The true gospel brings salvation, and salvation always brings joy. And friends, this is not a superficial joy you can experience because uh, you have something good happen in your life. It's not just the joy because you were given a gift card to go to the restaurant. That's nice. It's not bad uh, to go to the restaurant and take some of your friends. That's good. And you maybe have a joy for a minute. And then you ate, and that's it. That joy disappeared. No, this is not the joy connected to any of our circumstances. 
I like how in Acts 13, verse 48, we read that when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And this text in particular says that uh, uh, Paul says, okay, Jews, you do not accept the gospel, so now the gospel goes to the Gentiles so that Gentiles can become believers, they can, can, can become Christians. And it says that the Gentiles, they began rejoicing. That's the joy of salvation. In Acts 16, verse 34, Philippian jailer, Philippian jailer, just imagine a jailer who was in the jail at that time. It's not, it's not like a jailer, I'm always trying to imagine, like a person who sits in the library or somewhere like watching, like a person who sits, uh, what stands in our store and watching, okay, if you're trying to steal something like theft prevention kind of person. No, jailer at that time, he had to be really rough, had to be like real soldier who can fight the criminals. And the Philippian jailer in Acts 16, 34, when he believed, he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. This is a supernatural joy. This is a joy that a person can have only when he knows that he is accepted by God through Jesus Christ. Brothers, sisters, there are so many people around us that do not have joy. There are so many people around us that are actually in depression. And quite often, they don't need a psychotherapy. They don't need a psychologist. They need the gospel. They need the gospel. Maybe you know a believer, or perhaps it's even you today, who's downcast and miserable. And I want to tell you, you need to remind yourself the gospel. We always need the gospel in our daily lives. We always need to know what actually makes our life on this earth? Why are we still breathing? It's not because we're so good. It's not because we deserve to be here. It's not because we're so good and God needs to keep us so we can serve and then like something doesn't work and we become miserable. No, we're here because of his grace and because of his mercy and we're still here because God gives his mercy and because of his gospel. He wants us to proclaim the gospel, and that's why we're here. And I want us to evaluate our lives right now. Do we preach the gospel? Where can I preach the gospel, you might ask? Well, I'm just working, or I'm, I'm a stay-at-home mom, or whatever you can think of. Like, where can I preach the gospel? Well, basically anywhere. When we talk about evangelism, uh, what do you need for evangelism? Just think. I usually say, like, for evangelism, you need, like, three components. You need, uh, you need the good news. You need the gospel, one. You need the person who knows the gospel or evangelist, we can say. That's two. And the third, you need who? You need the audience. You need the one, the lost. You need the one who doesn't know the gospel yet. That's all you need. And you know what? Quite often that last ingredient, the audience or the lost person, the person who doesn't know the gospel, um, Christians have struggled with. Uh, many Christians think, like, where can I find that lost person? I'm always at the church. I, my, my kids are homeschooled. I don't, I don't interact with, a lot with the non-believers. Uh, recently, I read an article uh, that was helping me to get ready for evangelism. And I thought, 
uh, that those evangelism recommendations would be really helpful for all of us. So I wanted to share it with you so we can have some little bit practical application. So what can we do? How can we become evangelists? How can we let that line out the way the people at that time did it? So evangelism recommendations I want to give you. First of all, pray about it. Pray about your evangelism. It's so important. We cannot go and preach the gospel on our own. We don't have that power. We cannot find someone who we need. We don't have that power. We need the Spirit of God work in our hearts. We need Him to send the person whom we can share the gospel with. Second, be creative. Think outside the box about how and where you can start the conversations. Just think, what can you do? I like, I was listening to the testimony of one guy. He says, whenever he stay, uh, goes to the checkout uh, person uh, in the store, he all starts talking to him, what he heard. And he says, how's your day going? And sometimes, oh, it's so bad. I don't know, people are so grumpy and so many bad customers. And I'm like, you know what? I have a good news for you. I have a good news for you. Jesus died for you, and you can have joy because of him. Just think outside the box. Where? How we can share the gospel. And the third thing, be consistent and conscious about it. Sometimes we think, like, okay, well, I would pray about it. I would think about, I would think, I would think like, some, some try to do something creative, but then forget about it. It doesn't work. It didn't work out. I tried once, I tried twice, it didn't work. So something different needs to be done. No, we can see that Philip, he was traveling to Samaria, and he could find lots of reasons why he shouldn't speak the gospel to them. He could find so many reasons why he shouldn't preach the gospel. But he was conscious about it. He wanted to tell them the gospel. Uh, I read an example about one pastor who decided every time to go to the same restaurant. All the time. He decided he doesn't go to any other restaurants. He just goes always to the same restaurant with one purpose. He wanted to get to know all the people who worked at that restaurant. All the waiters, the cooks, and everyone. Why? Because he wanted to share the gospel with them. And when he shared the gospel with them, every time he was coming in, if they had any problems, any spiritual needs, they were coming to him and they knew, they knew that pastor. They knew he's the pastor. They knew that we can come and talk to him. I don't say that you need to start going only to one restaurant right now, but just think or be conscious about it. Think how, where we can find better ways to share the gospel. And um, another thing, be collaborative. Uh, so find ways to participate in evangelism with the other people from our church. I know that there are people who actually try to do different evangelism uh, or outreach uh, things in, by, by themselves. Uh, maybe we, we want to do like a barbecue and invite our neighbors and say, oh, you're doing the barbecue. That's good. Let me join you. I'd like to, to do that with you. I like to do it for our neighbors. Let's do it at your house first, and let's, let's come to my house and do it together in my house. But think of something in your hospitality ministry as well. It's a great way to conspire with the fellow believers for evangelism, where you can have a game night or something and invite your neighbors or friends, not Christian friends, to, to your house. And the last thing, be committed. Be committed to that. Again, I just want to stress it again. The gospel is the only way of salvation. There's no way. There's no any other way. If there's no gospel, there's no the truth about Christ and his salvation, there's no way we can save. People can be saved. Well, that's the first implication that we can take from this text. Preach the gospel. But I think there is another implication, and I think we can go through that much quicker, though there's a lot of interesting happening in there. And the second one, Second implication from our text, don't get discouraged while 
preaching the gospel. So first one, preach the gospel. Second, don't get discouraged while preaching the gospel. Uh, verse 14 in our text. Look again. Chapter 8, verse 14. We see that the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, and they sent Peter and John to them. I don't know about you, but the question comes up right away in my mind. Why is that? Was Philip much worse? Why would they need to send Peter and John? Wasn't this the place of uh, Philip's ministry in Samaria? Um, and the first reason I, think, I see uh, why we should not get discouraged, first of all, when God completes your work through other people. Don't get discouraged when God completes your work through other people. Again, in our text, we see that Peter and John come. They come, and their mission is threefold because they come to help Philip with a spiritual harvest. Secondly, they come with the apostolic sanction and blessing to Philip's work among, uh, among the Samaritans. And thirdly, they come uh, to pray for those who believe so that they might receive the Holy Spirit. By the way, what's this? Why they needed to pray for those believers to receive the Holy Spirit? Because some of the people actually even today say, like, oh, look at this. They became believers, and they didn't receive the Holy Spirit. It means that the Holy Spirit actually comes later in their lives. And um, such teaching actually ignores the transitional nature of the book of Acts. Because this period of church history is very unique. And besides uh, the teaching that the Holy Spirit comes later in uh, the lives of the Christian, that it doesn't come, actually uh, flies in the face of plain teaching of the Scripture that says in Romans 8, 9, if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, of Christ, he does not belong to him. So it means that if you don't have the Spirit, you're not belong to him, uh, then why did they have to receive it separately? The uniqueness of this period is proved by the miracles that Philip was doing, and something similar happens here with the Holy Spirit. In the Bible, we, have, we find only four occasions when the Holy Spirit had to be received in a way they could see. First occasion was on the day of Pentecost, when the apostles received the Holy Spirit. And remember, there were the tongues of fire. The second occasion we see here, because most likely something similar happened here in Samaria, when they received the Spirit, that's why other people around them, they were able to see that they received the Holy Spirit. The third occasion is later in chapter 10, when the first Gentiles received the Holy Spirit, and they received it the same way as the Jews received it initially. And the last occasion, the fourth one, is in chapter 19, when Paul meets the Old Testament believers who were baptized in John's baptism. That's the only four occasions. And in each of these cases, the Holy Spirit came down in the visible form when um, others were able to testify that. The question, I think, the biggest question, why did they need it? What's so special about that? You know what? God, by his providence, makes it so that every group, significantly different from the Jews, received the Holy Spirit in the visible form so that we wouldn't have several different churches like this is the Jewish church. This is the Samaritan church. This is the Gentile church. And we have all different churches. That's why, for example, if you just look a couple of pages ahead in chapter 11, chapter 11, uh, verse 15, Peter uh, reports what happened when he was preaching to the Gentiles. In verse 15, he says, As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. 
He says, I remember the word of the Lord. He said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And in verse 17, he says, if then God gave them the same gift as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? For the Jews, it was unthinkable. If they wouldn't get that spiritual gift or uh, 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 that the Spirit would become, come in visible way on those groups, they couldn't believe that they are accepted by God. They needed that. That's why Peter says, like, when the Spirit fell the same way on them as it did on us, he says, who am I to stand in God's way? God did that. That's why... The church, I like how in the um, letter to Ephesians, epistle to Ephesians, chapter 2, Paul writes, But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. God did that. Christ did that. He broke that wall. And that was shown through the uh, receiving of the Holy Spirit. So Peter and John come here in our text. We see they come and they pray because they become, they, they are the most prominent apostles and they the pillars of the Jerusalem church. And you know what? At that point, they come and they pray. And Philip could have said, well, let Peter and John then preach the gospel. If they have that power, let them preach the gospel. I, who am I then? I preach the gospel and they come and they reap the harvest, basically. But if he would start doing this, he would have gotten discouraged for sure. And the work of the gospel, the work of the gospel would have been affected at that point. You know what? Quite often, you might preach the gospel to someone and he doesn't get it. I remember once I was preaching to one guy and I was telling him the gospel. And I'm explaining him the gospel and telling him, you know who God is. Look at who God is. How perfect he is. How holy he is. And I'm like, look at yourself. You're a sinner. You can be saved only through Jesus Christ. Do you want to be saved? And he looked at me and said, like, are you crazy? Basically like that. And then he said, I don't like that God. He said, I don't like that God. And that's why I said, like, well, there's no another God. He said, I don't like that God. And he left. Three weeks later, I meet with that guy. Something happened in his life. But he goes to another church, and he meets with a youth pastor. And he says, tell me about God. And that youth pastor tells me exactly the same thing. And he repents. He repents and receives the gospel. And he comes to me and says, I believed. I said, what did he tell you? He told me this and this and this. I said, didn't I tell you the same? <laughs> At that point, I'm like, okay, God. It means that maybe I shouldn't preach the gospel. Maybe someone else should preach the gospel. Maybe that person needs to preach the gospel. But no, we shouldn't get discouraged if someone else actually adds to our work. I like how Paul writes in 1 Corinthians. He says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? He says, servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. And then he says, I planted Apollos watered. He didn't say, I planted, I watered, and then I picked the fruit. No, he says, I planted. Apollos watered. He added to my work. But God gave the growth. Then he says, so neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. The power is not in us. We need to preach the gospel. But God gives the growth. And if someone adds to our work, that's not the point of discouragement. 
Philip could have get really discouraged at that point, saying, oh, you know what, forget about this. Peter and John, they're apostles. They need to preach the gospel. I'll just go and sit in my room and do nothing. We know it didn't happen like that. Actually, if you look at chapter 21, Acts 21, it's so interesting. Uh, I don't even have this verse in here, and I know I need to get finishing. But in Acts uh, 21, uh, verse 8, we can see that on the next day we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist. Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. Look at that. That's the same Philip. That's the only time we meet Philip again in the Bible. There's no any other mention of Philip. But his, he went all the way up to Caesarea, and at that point he is called the Evangelist. He was not discouraged that God actually completed his work through the apostles. That was uh, opposite. Uh, he was encouraged through that. He was encouraged that I can preach the gospel. It doesn't matter who comes and help me with my work. That's what God wants to do. So we should not get discouraged when someone actually helps us to complete our work in the ministry. And the second thing, we should not get discouraged when you encounter false converts. Simon, Simon the Magician, I think that's the in, really interesting case in here. And I already told you that the magic uh, was really not the magic that we understand this, these days. Uh, and in verse 13, we actually read that Simon himself believed, and he also even was baptized. He was baptized, and um, he was following Philip. It says that he continued with Philip. But was it a genuine, genuine faith and baptism? So, I have so much to say, but I know that I don't have much time right now. Friends, look how it's interesting what was happening initially. Initially, we see that the people were paying attention to the Simon the Magician. Verse 10, it says, all people paid attention to him. What happened later when Philip showed up in verse 6, people started paying attention to Philip. If initially we see that all the people were amazed by Simon, Simon the Magician. He was amazed, uh, he, he was, uh, people were amazed by him and by his miracles and even saying that uh, he was some, someone great. But now later we see in verse 13 that Simon himself was amazed by what Philip was doing. And his declining popularity, his desire to be associated with Philip and God because he knew that only in such way he'll be able to maintain contact with people. He started to follow Philip and he even professed that he believed and even got baptized. Uh, and as a result, we see what he does. Simon approaches the apostles and he offers them money for the power. And as a result, we see his state. Look what, what it says in verse 20. Uh, Peter says to Simon, he says, May your silver perish with you. Then in verse 20, I says, You need, have neither part nor lot in this. Then he says, Repent of this wickedness. Pray to the Lord if possible. He says, I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. These are really, really harsh and strong words. Was it possible for Simon to be genuinely saved? Because maybe his profession, his magic didn't allow him. Well, actually, in the book of Acts, we know that there were some magicians who became believers. Um, in chapter 19, we read that there were magicians who became believers and actually burned all of their books and they... We can see like their complete change happening there. But here Peter calls the Simon to repentance. But look how he responds. He says, you pray for me. I can't pray. You pray for me. 
Unfortunately, unfortunately, something similar very often happens these days. People come to church for so many different reasons. People come to church for healing. People come to church for security from hell. They understand there is God and one day he'll judge me. People come to church for freedom from addictions. People come to church for fame and glory. People come to church for money and prosperity. People come to church to find a good wife and good husband. People come to church for lots of different reasons. But in all of this, if there is no Christ, there is no salvation. Simon, he got baptized. And by the way, that's another good indication that baptism doesn't save anyone. Even if you got baptized. But if you don't know Christ, it doesn't mean that you're saved. And, and here, I, I want to I ask us, I want to ask you, how do you preach the gospel? Do you promise the people a good life and health? And I know that sometimes, uh, even if you preach the true gospel, people can reject it. But if you muddy the gospel with promises that the Bible doesn't give, most likely people will not be attracted to Christ. They'll be attracted to whatever else you give them. But more than that, I wanted us to examine our lives right now. I want you to examine your life right now. Why are you in the church today? Unfortunately, unfortunately, I've been asking people quite a lot recently. I say, why do you think people go to the Catholic church? There's no gospel in the Catholic church. There's not much preaching on the Bible in the Catholic church, but people going in big crowds to the Catholic church. People go to any other called churches or gatherings in big crowds. Why? What draws them there? Quite often people go there because they got used to going there. Quite often people go there because they think that if I go there, God will count that for my salvation. God will see, oh, he was going to church. I will count. Oh, he was offering money to the church. Oh, yeah, I need to save that person. But friends, being at the church doesn't save you. Even being baptized doesn't save you. And I want us to check our hearts. Why are you at the church today? But at the same time, I want to encourage you. If you preach the gospel, and if the person professed faith, but eventually... He turned out to be not a believer. He rejected the faith. Don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged because false converts are in the church. Even Jesus said the parable, remember, we don't tear it. He says, yeah, there always will be people in the church that will look like Christians, but they're not so. But we need to preach the gospel. I like how in 2 Corinthians 2, Paul writes, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 15, he says, For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death, to the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient to these things, says Paul. And I like how Charles Spurgeon, in another uh, well, he says, let the sun shine in brilliance. It shall moisten the wax, it shall harden clay. So it is with the gospel, although it is the very sign of righteousness to the world, although it is God's best gift, although nothing can be in the least comparable to the vast amount of benefit that is bestowed on the human race, yet, even of that, we must confess that sometimes it is the odor, odor from death to death. Friends, we still must preach the gospel because if there's no gospel, there's no salvation. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Only the gospel can save and bring joy, nothing else. Don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged when God is finishing the work of the gospel, not the way you thought it must be finished. Continue preaching the gospel. And as Charles Persian said, preach 
Jesus Christ and him crucified. Let the lion out and see who will dare to approach him. Let the lion out, dear friends, and see who will dare approach him. May God bless you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for Jesus Christ, for his life and the salvation that we can have only in him and through him. Father, thank you so much that we have the gospel. And right now we pray for everyone who is standing before you right now. You know each and every one of us. And you know if we actually preach the gospel to the people around us. Father, please help us search our hearts. If we do not preach the gospel, why does it happen? Maybe we got discouraged sometimes. Maybe we got discouraged because we, people didn't receive the gospel the way we were hoping they would receive it. Maybe we got discouraged because uh, we see that some people are actually not real believers. They are false converts. But Father, most of all, help us to check our hearts. Maybe we do not preach the gospel because we do not know the gospel. Because the gospel didn't make that work in our hearts. Father, please help us examine our lives and see where we are. Help us to remember that Jesus Christ is the only name through whom we can be saved and whom we can preach so people can be saved. And help us to carry that out and go and preach the word to everyone we can preach to. We ask all of that in his matchless name. Amen.